I am. These talks are a sort, sort of discipline. I go into them without any idea of what I am about to talk about. And I like that. That's a powerful way of dialectic. Much goes through my mind and my path is, as I've spoken of, dying well. It's a path of kindness, of being duty, of transmuting anger and rage into love. So, for me, speaking is really, and this discourse is really important because it coalesces all my ideas, my philosophy, the reality of things. For instance, during my workout, I think I was doing some leg stretches. The air got really misty and I looked out over the gorge and one of the most complete and huge rainbows was sitting over the gorge from corner to corner. Sun, rain, rainbow, it was remarkable. When faced with a reality like that, when faced with such beauty, when faced with such complexity of sensuous expression and experience, it doesn't put me in the state of death, oh my, I don't, I just want to continue seeing this. It puts me in the state of, I have seen it. There it is. There is a beautiful moment. I could die at that moment. I could die right at this moment. This is perfect. So I don't go into a fear-based place. I go into a fully present place, a fully present in every possible way. I am, I can die, I, there is the rainbow, there is the mist, there is the sky, there are the clouds, there is everything. And there are the snails climbing over the offerings that all the women put out. I thought I should talk about my frangipanning because I really love them. I put a frangie penny in my ear before every walkabout. Um, I started noticing them as soon as we got to Bali, but I started also really being so attracted to them. Um, when I kept seeing them in my path and then I would see them in Ganesha's ear on various of the statues around town and I was very attracted to it. I also started putting it in my ear and I experienced several things by doing so. One, I felt very much in alignment with Ganesha, very much in alignment with the, uh, with the heroic mythos or mythic beings that surround you in Bali, the Hindu mythic beings. I felt very connected to them by doing so. I felt very, and again, I come up against this word beautiful. I feel connected to the flower an intimacy with the flower. I also, the scent of the frangipani wafts out of the 
these beautiful yellow white petals so soft so open wafts around my head while I wear it in my ear so I'm full of its smell and being full of its smell I'm not full of my very strange smell my aging smell my acidic sour smell as I get older which all pe old people do and smell like it's part of the aging process so I really love wearing my frangy panties. I have it in my ear almost all the talks. I missed it the other day and I was sad about it. I was sad for the frangy panty and I was sad for me. <laughs> for me, all the world, all everything is alive. I do not look at things as inanimate. They have a, I would say, a uh, um, increasing amount of liveness. For instance, the tree is more alive than the camera, but the camera is alive to me. It doesn't have my feelings, it doesn't have uh, a yearning to grow, it stays pretty much the same. It is also very much a commodity or a material thing. It, its liveness is much less powerful, it is much more of an ownership thing. It's much more of something owned rather than something that has choice and consciousness. And yet at the same time, I think of it as alive. It's strange, it's me though. I speak to the snails, I speak to the butterflies as you might know, I play to them all too. During the walkabout, I sing to the plants, I sing to the trees, I sing to the rivers. Everything is alive to me. I love that everything is alive. So this is my perspective. This is my hologram. This is my holographic reality to bring life to all things to try not to own too many things because in ownership there is slavery. So I'm very sensitive to slavery. I'm very sensitive to things working for me. I try to do everything myself. When something works for me, then I am in honor and thankful to it, even the camera, which is material. I am thankful to the tree for its shade. I am thankful to the flowers and to the frangipani for its scent. I am thankful to the rainbow. So all of that is called gratitude. And for me, gratitude and gratefulness are, as you can see, one of the most important parts of my living. Its connection to death is such that I do not have any, and I do not, I cannot say that for sure. I do try not to have any regrets. I am grateful towards all my moments. I try not to yearn for too much. I am grateful to all that comes my way. So that is a practice of mine. It is a practice that most people around me have no idea about. There are a few things that I practice that nobody has any idea about, nor 
care about, nor, and in fact, in noticing that I do that, they would have a critical, judgmental, depreciation of me. For instance, I practice left and right usage of my hands and body and being. So therefore I write and draw with my left hand too. Not just my right hand, I draw both. And with my left hand I draw backwards and I read backwards. That is so that I scan the universe both left and right. That is what I mean by a two-man being. Most people just scan from one direction, and that is part of a, tra a um, trapping, part of the way the world works. It works from a right-handed perspective. All things are cast in a right-handed way. This, therefore, scissors are all right-handed. Um, various tools have a right-handed slant. However, if one cuts with the left hand, if one cuts in the opposite direction, looks from the opposite direction, there's another world there. When Bob Laugh and I were together, this is what we spent a lot of time looking into, is this um, Tuman being perspective. So what that means basically is that I am a beginner from my left-hand side compared to my right-hand side. Since when I was born, my mother and father basically forced me into right-handedness by giving me and showing me a object that I would grab for with my right hand. Thus, I became right-handed. But I had a left-handed already. I was left-handed. So when I played baseball, when I was in baseball, um, I could hit both the left-handed and right-handed. I learned that Part of my um, discovery was that I could hit both left and right, so I was called a switch hitter. And when the pitcher would be right or left-handed, then I could switch and be the opposite of them, which enables you to see the ball faster. You can see where the ball's coming from because if you're left-handed hitting with a right-handed pitcher, the ball is coming a longer distance to you. I liked being a switch hitter. It, it gave me a lot of uh, advantage in my uh, team. I also enjoy using chopsticks with my left and right hand. So I, so when I'm uh, using uh, my left-handed chopsticks, I'm not as adept as with my right hand. But I still do it, sometimes dropping a piece of sushi in my lap, sometimes being very clumsy. But that doesn't matter. And there I illustrate the depreciation. Because if somebody watches me eating with my left hand, they go, oh, he's kind of not good at chopsticks, or he's a beginner at chopsticks, or something like that, some judgment that is critical. And in actuality, I'm much more advanced than they are because I can switch hands ba back and forth with my chopsticks. I can pick up this, I can pick up some ginger with my right hand, then pick up some an edamame with my left hand, then pick up a piece of sushi with my right hand, and then pick up a piece of lettuce with my left hand at the same time scanning both directions of my plate and seeing all the stuff that is placed on my plate in either direction. 
So what that illustrates is how people's perspective is so marred, mired, mired, marred, marred by their inability to know or to even conceive that a more advanced expression is in front of them. Instead, they take it from their right-handed perspective or even left-handed perspective looking and only see that it, would, it must be that there's just one one direction in me. There is just one. I am a human being, but I am a human being. Another thing that I practice is playing the violin left and right. When I play left, the violin is not meant to be a left-handed instrument, so it is extremely clumsy and cumbersome to do so. But what it does anyway is it gives me the ability to bow the violin with my left hand. And it's the bowing part of playing the violin that is the most subtle and difficult. And that's where the production of sound comes from. That is where, as a violinist, you have a great quality or a great ability to express. A lot of people focus on the fingering. They focus on playing fingers really quickly, very fast. They want to get a lot of notes really fast. Guitarists do that too because guitarists are all about plucking. They're in, they have no, there's not really any bow situation for them. The bow, they just pluck. They get the string ringing and then they, they put their fingers down. Violinists, string musicians, use a bow. The bow has a have hair that, uh, fibers that move from frog to tip and they cause the string to vibrate and the string, the, the hairs then pull the string, cause them to vibrate and the string then makes a tone. That tone is very, very powerful. When you know how to bow, you know how to make the string do all sorts of wonderful things. And that is what is one of the qualities that has caused me to be a certain type of violinist. I bow in a way because of the gracefulness of my hand and the gracefulness of my touch. I bow the violin a very different way than most violinists. That is my quality. It's subtle. So, Doing it left-handed then has shown me how to do it left-handed and has taught me how to do it even better with my right hand. Again, this is the quality of a human being. The other thing that I do that nobody notices, and I do it for myself, I do it to die well, is to sit upright, to sit with my head sitting on top of my spine and to dance and to be with my head on top of my spine because when one leans over, and I let myself do so every once in a while, but one leans over, the head then starts pulling on the spine and reducing the strength of the spine. As one gets older, that becomes very, very important because as you age, your spine ages and becomes less capable of holding the weight of your head. So what I see a lot of times when I'm sitting in a table or in a dining room with people is they lean over their plate eating. How much time we spend eating is huge. And we're also very involved in the food, so we bend over our plates. We eat with a bent over head. This is very wearing on the spine. Instead, 
the best way to eat is to eat with one's head on top of one's spine and to lift the food to our mouths. This allows for a better and more erect and more graceful way of eating. It's a little difficult because one has to be very graceful with one's fork or chopsticks, lifting them from the plate to one's mouth instead of pushing one's head over the plate and then shoveling the food into one's mouth. It's very important to me. When I am in a dining room, as I say, I look around and everybody is bent over their plates. I see people, the most aged people, bent over their plates, their heads bowed over. And how much stress that is for their spine is amazing. The head is heavy. These are some of the things I like to practice as a being. They are important things to practice for me. There are many other things I practice also, but I will take my time in elaborating them. As I said, one of those things also is to be in the world in the most happy and exuberant way I can be. To say and to greet all beings with immense joy and that feeling of gratefulness and that feeling of recognizing in them the holographic divinity that they are, which is kind of known in this world as namaste. To me, it is recognizing that everybody can have the possibility of expressing I am and thus be fully in their divine self, as I do always practice. This is Im eminently important to me, just like all the things I speak about. As a human being, I am. I spoke briefly about irony yesterday, and I feel that I really didn't get to the heart of the matter. I kind of graced over it. I think I did this, but because of the internet being down and my inability to review my discourse yesterday, I'm unclear about my expression about irony, which I am a great user of. Irony is... Um, is one of my ways of being and expressing to people and in the world. I remember sitting at the table with my sisters and my mother and they were just chatting away and all the time, almost all the time, I would make some ironic comment about what was being expressed amongst them because my family are extremely talkative. Not only talkative, but loud when they talk. So. I would always just sit there and make these ironic, sarcastic comments about everything. It taught me how to listen, but it also gave me a very sarcastic method of communication. What's interesting about that is that when I got to school and the teachers were using this word and they were speaking of irony all the time to me, and I was not understanding what is irony. I don't understand what this word means. Why, why do you mean the author is ironic when they say this? It was interesting from that point of view as how much I used it. I was, I, I'm an extremely talented, ironic person and at the same time I was not understanding what irony meant. And so those two things had to come together. I had to understand what I was good at and what that meant to be good at it. What was it that I was being good at? It? I was being good at seeing the opposite of things all the time. I was seeing how something that could 
perhaps say it is a blessing on the world and that at the same time was causing illness. That somebody who could be saying they were so smart at the same time they could do something so stupid. That is ironic. It's ironic for something that is so completely the opposite to be present at the same moment in the same being, in the same action. It is the epitome of the Tao. The Tao is, represents irony. Because here you have the dark side that also holds the light side. And here you have the light side that also holds the dark side. And it spins. It is life. Life is irony. Irony is life. It is the most wondrous thing to truly understand this, to truly embrace irony as a way that things are. Because when one does, one then sees also that in the life is death. And thus, there is no reason to fear death. It is a reason to be so embracing of death, so welcoming of death, and yet full of life. Those two together is the way to be. The way to be separated from it, the way the religions do it, the way they make you fear death. This is not living. This is constant fear of death. So therefore, death no longer is wanting to be welcomed into life. And thus, there is a separation, and thus is the ir irony of the situation. The irony of religion, the irony of controlling all beings with faith, so that people and all of you are afraid of death. I will be redundant. I love being redundant because I constantly go over a subject because I can't finish it. It's unfinishable. It is, I cannot finish the topic of death. I cannot finish the topic of life. I cannot finish the topic of Yeshua. I cannot finish the topic of Socrates. I cannot finish my own beingness and what I and how I am with all of these wondrous historical beings who so stood by teaching those around to live and to die. All of them did that. That is my path also.